welcome everyone to uh, this session with uh, Evie Chiobanu. She's going to be talking to us about writing great tests with Haskell. So uh, without me blathering on any longer, Evie, it's over to you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Before I start, I want to like do a very, very small, like I'm definitely not an expert. I don't publish papers. I'm not the uh, uh, verification or anything expert. I just have some experience and I want to share it with, with, with everyone. And I think we can, yeah, we can do better. So uh, the, the title is a bit of a uh, <laughs> exaggerations because um, like I, I've, I've seen this sort of test before, it's nothing necessarily new. I just never, I, I don't know of any other talk or presentation about this. So hopefully it will be interesting for everyone. Um, okay, so the overview is kind of, I, I wanted to start with a like, short presentation of software verification. I know a lot of you probably know about the, the world of software verification, but I kind of, um, yeah, I kind of thought just in case there are some things that you might not be aware of, some areas, I, I would just mention them. And then I, I'm not going to go into depth into any of them other than unit tests, as you can probably see from the overview. I just kind of want to give you a quick feel of, hey, if you haven't heard about something from here, maybe ask me or maybe look it up or, or whatever, right? Because there are a lot of things and I, I strongly believe that they, they somehow complement each other a lot, right? Um, okay, so, oh, and, and uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions during the, uh, the, the presentation. I will be like taking breaks and answering them as, as they happen. Okay, so we are going to start with like a very incomplete and very brief overview of software verification. Again, from my perspective, it's, I'm probably missing a lot of things, but uh, hey, <laughs> and especially like it's also from a lens of like Haskell and FP uh, quite a bit. Okay, so first off, I think we can all agree that writing software is really, really complex, right? It's uh, uh, like we, we know that like we rarely see a program without bugs, right? Even trivial programs often have bugs. So uh, given that like a we can we, we often can write a bug in a maybe 10 20 100 line program it's it's quite unst understandable that there will be quite a few of them in like 10,000 100,000 or a million lines code application right um and we of course we do our best to not write bugs right so we uh, we do code reviews we do uh, where like we kind of have people read code right and that's one way we can avoid adding bugs uh, and like, don't get me wrong, this list will not be in the order of from uh, bad to good or from important to not important. I think all of these like go well together and they each spot a different class or somewhat different class of problems. So I think code reviews are great. Um, um, okay, then like we also have some sort of best practices sometimes, right? We have maybe a style document or a coding guidelines document somewhere that we point to when doing, especially when doing code reviews or when, when starting on a new code base. And we say, hey, we, we attempt to do this or that in a, uh, in a code base just so that we can kind of avoid some problems. Like this is not necessarily verification in the sense that, hey, we know this is a bug if we do this. It's just, hey, we, like, we kind of learned that <laughs> not doing this or doing it in a certain, doing things in a certain way can, uh, can make it easier for us to reason about code maybe or to, to read code later. Uh, and then, of course, since we are at a functional programming conference and I'm a Haskler, uh, I strongly believe that using uh, functional languages and particularly strongly typed functional programming languages help, at, at least help me and, I, I, and probably a lot of other a lot of other folks in reasoning about code, right? We have some guarantees, and then we can um, that helps us from creating at least some classes of bugs. Um, then there's tools, right? We can, that can analyze code. And when I say tools, uh, to point out common pitfalls, I'm mostly thinking about things like maybe linters, right? Like hlint for Haskell or um, anything that kind of reads your code and kind of heuristically tries to figure out whether you've done something wrong. We can also like maybe, for example, th there's some some things that are in between, right? So in between um, like the language Haskell and tools, there's maybe enabling all warnings, right? Which is not a default Haskell, but maybe incomplete pattern matching falls somewhere in between, right? The language and using tools to analyze, right? Depending on how you view these sort of things. 
Um, okay, then we, we can start thinking about, hey, what if I run the code, like manually run the code once, like the program to see what happens, right? Does it do what I what it, what we expect it to do? And that's that's quite valuable, right? Like uh, <laughs> there are some class of errors that we will never see, or it's very hard to see unless you actually run it, right? Because like you, you, everything might be perfect, but you forgot to like connect the main with the actual program and it does nothing or whatever, right? It's <laughs> uh, of course, that's an extreme example, but this, that sort of thing is very hard to test, right? And so it's a lot easier to just run it once and see what happens. Um, then we get to the part that everybody thinks about and they think of testing, right? Or automated verification or something like that, right? Especially like folks in the industry, um, like writing the unit property integration testing. That's kind of like the, the, the meat of like testing as far as software practices go today in, in most of software programming. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details because we're going to <laughs> go through it uh, later. Um, then writing documentation is also a way that a lot of people don't think about when uh, as a way of verifying code, right? Because it's kind of a very, it's not checked, right? It's kind of closer to a code review, right? Where like when you add documentation, you kind of explain some things and maybe you give the reviewer a chance to kind of double check his understanding, right? Because he has some understanding or they have some understanding of, from reading the code. And then that might change while reading documentation. It might pop up some, oh, wait, but the code did something different than what I done documentation said, or I, I, I'm not sure. Let me read that again, right? So writing documentation is a great way to, to improve uh, uh, or rather to, to decrease the amount of bugs in a way, right? Because you, you get one more thing that you can, you can, you can use there. Um, then we can go like, and, and it's they're kind of from now on, it's kind of going into more like software verification as a uh, computer science, right? Where we can write, sketch out some proofs on paper, for example, right? Where we can say, well, uh, we know like all of the cases and we kind of want to prove on paper, maybe not very formally that uh, uh, some property holds, right? That uh, we can never go into an infinite loop or we can, we will always have a, like well-behaved output for, for, for our inputs or whatever, right? And again, this is not, this is very close to writing documentation, but it's a very specific sort of documentation, if you will, um, a more formal, if, if, if you will. Um, okay, then you can, we can use model checking. There are a lot of software which allows us to like kind of create a model of our program and verify that it has certain pro properties. Now, this is of course not like, this will not guarantee that our code is correct <laughs> because when like it, there's like the model tells us okay this model is correct and does what we think it does but then it's our responsibility to kind of very like visually or manually verify that the model and the software are similar in ways right that, like the, the 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 code that we write the haskell or whatever code we write kind of follows the model's uh, logic um but again uh, it's it's a good way to do it and it's not very expensive in the sense that it uh, let me go to the next slide so next we have symbolic execution where this is kind of brings things together uh, it's very hard to do because there are very few <laughs> uh, programs that do this very few and, and frameworks i don't know how to call them uh, that do this right and because it's a lot of work so what this requires is you need to have a formal description of your programming language uh, then you have to have a like or rather of the target programming language, let's say Haskell in this case, right? You need to like formally describe it in like a, a language. And then in the same language, you'd probably have to describe what you expect the program to do. And then kind of uh, input your program as well and kind of see if everything matches, right? Uh, the like uh, the pro like the software kind of trying to symbolically execute your program through uh, through it, the language semantics and the, the expect like the thing that you're trying to prove. Uh, this turns out to be very complicated to do for non-trivial programs and more complicated programming language. So it's something that we don't often do in, in, in the Haskell world. Although maybe, hopefully at some, some time we, we will be able to, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then there are other kinds of automatic verification. I'm not going to go into like what those could be. I'm going to mention a few examples later, but uh, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of like for me. This is the big overview. I'm, I'm sure there are other ways to 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 verify, but for me, these are the uh, the main ones. I, I should say. Uh, okay, so there are quite a few. Uh, like, let me go back for a second. So there's quite a few 
things here, right? So we can kind of group them into some sort of categories just to sort of make it easier for us to uh, to reason about like, hey, how do we make sense of this list, this list right? So one of one group, one obvious group for me is mentally reasoning about code, right? So here we can do code, we can add code reviews, like the set of best practices, documentation, even sketching out proofs, right? We use our like, we read things, we don't like formally verify anything. It's it's not automated in any way. We just read code, think about it and say, okay, this might be a problem, this is probably not a problem and so on. Um, then there's a set of like trying examples out, right? And that goes from like running things manually to like having uh, like automating running uh, examples, right? Or the true unit property or integration tests. Uh, and then kind of using tools to, to reason about code, right? And here we can add stuff like uh, the like the compiler in case it's statically checked in, in any way or has static types, uh, tools and all the other like model checking, supporting execution or automatic verification. Um, okay, and I'm gonna like slowly dive into how I think and why I think these are like complement each other well, uh, because I, I don't think like, I'm, not, I'm never going to say one one of these is better than the other. I think that they're they're very well at like uh, they work very well together. Okay, so when we mentally reason about code, we we shouldn't try to or at least for me, I, I don't really try when I do a code review to kind of make sure that every uh, like I, I don't try to be a compiler, right, or in interpreter. I don't try to make sure that the types the like types check because that's what GHC already does. I, I, I'm not better at that than, than GHC and never will be. So what I try to do is I, I, I formed some mental heuristics at reading code and I, I know what kind of things from experience are often, like we often get wrong as, a pro, as programmers. And again, like this is in general in, at SFP and then in particular in our code base, right? So the more experience you have with like programming general FP in particular and then the code base you're working on in particular, then the, the better you would probably be at, at this sort of heuristics. Um, so yeah, sometimes you can like just read into code, you can figure out problems that uh, like tools would, might not easily find or not find at all. And also especially like styling, uh, things that deal about styling, like, hey, this might be a problem later because this, that's something that tools will very, that got very hard to, to, to have specific rules for tools to, to find that sort of problem. Um, so yeah, it's a great way to improve code quality. Uh, you can find like big, big picture problems, right? Because like we're better at, taking a step back and looking at the like big picture. Um, and sometimes you can detect that cases if, you, if you're really familiar with the system or, uh, or the problem domain, because you can think like, at least as programmers, we're usually wired to think about edge cases, right? So sometimes you can find them, but not always. It's, it's, it's kind of, uh, <laughs> it, it depends on a lot of things in my experience. Uh, okay, then trying examples out can sometimes surprise us, right? We've often ran something and didn't believe the compiler, like not the compiler, but like, like the, the, the program, like the results are like, wait, what? what is going on, right? So that, that's something that happens quite often when uh, as uh, in the life of a programmer, right? Uh, so that's a great way to find problems, right? Very early, that's, it, you should like, the code bases should have a simple way to run things and, and test uh, simple examples out. So. Uh, I think it's a very useful case. You usually have a quick feedback loop, right? You can just run it and see what happens. Of course, some programs will be slower than others, but uh, yeah. Um, and also like they can increase like, our confidence, right? Because uh, it works. So we at least know that at least a happy case or at least some cases do work. Uh, of course, you'll never be able to guarantee the absence of bugs in when uh, uh, just trying a few examples out, right? Um, right, and then Tooling itself, we can split into several other subcategories, if you will, right? So some some tools give us tools give us some guarantees, right? For example, static static typing or or other checks like uh, the one I mentioned earlier that there's any uh, GHC uh, uh, warning that can be enabled, like uh, incomplete pattern matching. Right? This this is a pretty strong guarantee, right? Because in a lot of other languages, you can definitely have a lot of bugs due to uh, Specifically, this class of bugs, right? Uh, dynamic typing or uh, non, like not ha like having incomplete pattern checks. Um, so yeah, this is definitely some level of guarantee. Although, of course, it it will never uh, guarantee no no bugs. Uh, again, tools that enforce best practices or heuristics, where it can be anything from like 
running the uh, I know code formatter. Right? That's something that goes into like best practices because like we want to have a code base that's like feels like a uh, I know that, that like doesn't differ from module to module, right? It's uh, feels like a a whole thing rather than separate things. Um, or HLint or any other like your tools, which usually use heuristics to kind of uh, find like or suggest things. Um, and then tools which uh, are used to uh, formally prove properties or code, right? And here we will see some some examples of tools which work with Haskell and some things that can use like to complement code. Um, but like these tools give you usually stronger guarantees than than the others. Um, and more customizable guarantees, if you will. Okay, so like I can't kind of going quickly go through like these subcategories here just to like make sure that we are uh, clear on what they are. Um, so static typing, as I said, give us some guarantees about the code. Uh, sometimes you can uh, like languages with a lot of uh, advanced types. I, I would say uh, I'm. Haskell or even more than Haskell, right? Dependently type languages like Agda or Idris or, or whatever can give us opportunities to encode a lot of uh, advanced variants in our type system, which are going to be checked by compiler, which we can be sure that they will, or relatively sure, I guess, unless we, we make errors at a type level uh, that uh, will like protect us from a certain class of, 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 of bugs, right? Um, of course, some of them would be easier to encode and others would be a lot more complicated. So uh, again, it's something that should be discussed or like kind of th there should be some sort of okay this is too complex for our for like, like for what we want to do and this is probably should be left as a like manual check rather than a uh, like type a strong type check right uh, again usually quick feedback loop of course compilation times can be a problem especially with like the more complex uh, type level machinery used uh, usually it translates to a uh, worse compile time so yeah, uh, be careful about that because it can definitely get to a point where it's unbearable. Um, and of course, even with the uh, dependent type languages, there is a limit to what we can reasonably encode, uh, and that uh, uh, that that makes programming and like uh, a lot harder, um, and making changes to the system a lot harder, and so on. So um, sometimes it's literally just impractical to to encode. Uh, some properties into like correct by construction variants or sorry, in other ways in, in, in the type system. Uh, okay, then linters and other static analyzers are a great way to find like common set of problems or rather to, I'm not gonna say necessarily fine, although that's what I wrote, because they will not necessarily, they're not say this is a bug or this is a problem. They very rarely do that. They will most more, more often say, hey, this might be a problem or hey, uh, the like the, uh, uh, this repository pr prefers this style over that style for some reasons, right? Um, so yeah, it's a great way to kind of avoid a certain type of problem. And uh, one other thing that I think is important is the sooner th these sort of uh, linters are introduced to a code base, the better it is, because if you have a like very large code base, it can often be annoying and uh, like uh, high time, high effort and also like kind of a end up in a like huge PR which changes the whole code and it needs a freeze or whatever. So it's kind of, yeah, it's better to, st <laughs> to, st to start clean if possible uh, or start as soon as possible rather. Uh, you also usually get a quick feedback loop from linters because they are usually faster, right? Since they don't have to go through, like they don't have to prove anything or to go through a lot of examples or even to run code. They just need to analyze the code at the static level. They're reasonably fast. I'm gonna say very fast because yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then formal proofs are a way to like do, do, kind of prove things uh, in a rigorous way, right? You can be sure that if something you can formally prove something, that's it will always stand or be correct. Of course, you can always have like uh, uh, you can be proving the wrong thing, or you can have you can assume something that is wrong, and then the whole proof doesn't stand. So again, there is there's you can never be a hundred percent, but uh, of course, this help a lot. Um, so there are some tools which allow you to formally prove parts of programs, at least. Uh, and in the Haskell world, we have Liquid Haskell, which is, if you haven't looked at it, I highly recommend you do because uh, it's it's actually quite a, quite a, quite a, like a great project and very interesting from the uh, verification perspective. 
Um, other ways that I've seen more or less often uh, used when talking about formal verification in in the world of FP and Haskell is using dependent type languages to model part of the code or even to do translations, but that's uh, a bit more complicated. And usually the languages used by by people who are close to Haskell are Koch, Idris, Agda, and more recently Lee to, to prove various parts of the like model. Uh, and also it makes it easier because languages like these are at least in syntax, especially uh, Idris and Agda are closer in syntax to Haskell. So uh, it's kind of, it's slightly easier to then follow the model and write that same code in Haskell and some, there are even tools to uh, automatically translate from like a dependent type language to and from Haskell, although they are, uh, they don't produce the best uh, code and sometimes it's very, very slow, especially Agda to Haskell is, uh, or at least used to be, I haven't looked in, in a bit, but it used to be a lot of uh, unsafe courses, which makes uh, the uh, uh, optimizer actually be worthless. So it the result is very slow. But then again, like if you have a very small core of things that you need to uh, prove and you need to like a, have a formal proof of, then that might be reasonable, right? Just like a small part of the, your code, which is just translated directly or something. Um, okay. Uh, so we are done with the incomplete overview of software verification, and now we're going to kind of zoom into software testing and then unit tests, and then like the, the main thing that I want to say about unit tests. So if there's any questions for uh, like the big overview thing, feel free to pop them in the Q&A, and I will probably take a moment to, to answer them uh, uh, then. So, but meanwhile, I will continue with the, <laughs> with the testing. Okay, so. Testing specifically, so why do we write tests? Well, they're easy to write, right? Like uh, compared to formal proofs, writing tests is, is a lot easier. And uh, like we learn about it more, like there's a lot more material to learn about. The, the material is at the level that most software engineers will be easy, like will have an easy way to follow. There's a lot of examples and courses and so on, right? It's, it's just pretty much instrumenting your code to, to to, to execute more or less, right, or parts of your code. So we understand how to do that. So it's it's easy to write it. It's like, it's cheap for us to do so. Uh, it also provides an immediate value, right? It, you don't have to think a lot before, like what kind of property do I want to prove about my, as with formal proofs, right? What kind of property does my uh, subsystem have or, or anything like that, right? I just like, I have an immediate value, I can write it. And like, I, I know this part works as I expect it to work. Um, then, of course, writing tasks can act as additional specification documentation, right? Because it's, you kind of like everything, like whatever you do when you try to verify something, you'll have to repeat yourself, right? That's the core thing that I think uh, we need to understand when we are verifying something, right? We have the code and then we have to kind of repeat ourselves either through tasks, through proofs, or through documentation to kind of like double check that these things are in um, accord, right? Um, so, of course, tests can also act as specification or documentation because, hey, if the test says something should pass, that that that, that gives you more information about that thing, right? Uh, again, you can like you can write once and run many times, which uh, is great. You can like you can and definitely should add your test to your CI and make sure that you don't accidentally break them. Like future code doesn't actually accidentally break it. Um, and as, as I like, as as I was hinting, as as I was explaining it, it's a I think it's a very practical middle ground between like manually running your program and formal proofs. Um, which is not to say that either of those things is uh, useless or shouldn't be uh, uh, doesn't have its its uh, its place. It's just a uh, something that is often a, a very good middle ground. Um, okay, so we've like like kind of, kind of hinted about this earlier, but we have like three big categories of unit tasks or of tests, sorry, um, and like the like, I outsorted them in like some order that I think is better for presenting. So I'll start with integration tests, where usually you will have like manual inputs, right? You will have like this specific scenario that you're testing. You'll very rarely automatically generate integration tests because they are slow, right? You, you, we don't want to. We usually don't want to. Um, like use a automatic generator and run like hundreds of samples of uh, for the same integration test because that will take forever. Um, or 
like at least with some software, it will take a very long time. And the, well, by accuracy, what I mean is the accuracy is if a integration test fail, how like how quickly and how easily can I pinpoint to the actual programming code? And usually, since integration test tests like a big subsystem or even your whole system, its its accuracy is pretty low, right? You might have an idea depending on the error you're getting uh, about what is uh, wrong, but it's uh, it's often the lowest kind of accuracy you can get through a uh, software test. Then we have property tests, right, where uh, inputs are generated. The execution is usually fast because we're testing a small module or a small function or like a small subset of our, of our code. Um, and even though we run a lot of examples, hopefully this, each example that we run is, is quite fast. And the accuracy, again, because we're testing a small part of our code, if one of the property tests fails, we know for each input it has failed. We can, some of the, some of the property testing libraries have shrinking mechanisms where if a large example fails, it will try to shrink the example to the smallest, uh, uh, so that's like the smallest example, which still fails, which is great because like we all like to have the minimal reproduction case. Um, so usually the accuracy is quite high. And then we have unit tests where we manually generate inputs. Uh, it's the fastest execution I, I, because it's like just a few tests, right? You don't have to like, it's not automatically trying things uh, until something fails. Uh, and again, the accuracy is technically high if it's an actual unit test because it again, it tests a small area of the code. Um, okay, so integration tests, as I said, is often they're they're often easy to write and understand by non-programmers because it's kind of like we use the oftentimes the public quote unquote API of a uh, of a of the thing that we're testing, right? So we will like call an API or like pass some con com like a file or some uh, console flags or whatever, right? And that's that's easy, easier easy to understand for like product or domain experts. Um, Again, it's slow, so that's that's not great. Uh, and the setup sometimes can be complex, right? If you need databases or other services or specific setup, then uh, it, it can be quite of a quite of pain to, to to set things up for for integration tests. Uh, and yeah, when they fail, finding the the the, the code can be tricky. Uh, sometimes it can take even days or more, right? Sometimes you, you just know something is wrong, but you have to essentially just debug everything to find out what, which is, I mean, it's it's better than not to have, than not to know you have a problem, but it's kind of frustrating because it, it doesn't help you in pinpointing the problem sometimes. Um, okay, so property tests. They are, you can encode high level properties rather than test cases, which is usually a stronger guarantee about uh, your program. But then again, the downside is you have to find out what those are, right? And mm, it's not always trivial to do so. Um, they usually run reasonably fast. Um, you can uh, you, you can find unexpected bugs here because the gener if if a ger generator is uh, well written and uh, uh, then it can generate examples that you might not think about or you might uh, like have a hard time coming up with. Um, and uh, yeah, again, depends a lot on the. Uh, on how well you define the generators, right? And like you have to be very careful because property tests are not proofs, right? Even if you have a property which kind of looks like a proof where you can say uh, this property always holds and even if it passes every time, that doesn't mean that it will always, that, that's the case because your generator might be might not be producing the right inputs because there's like you haven't thought about them. So uh, they can give you a false sense of security sometimes. Um, Okay, so that's the software testing. I'm going to quickly go through unit tests, and then we can uh, we can have a look at uh, what I'm proposing. Okay, so as I said, unit tests usually run reasonably fast. Um, they usually, or should I would say, test a single thing, whether it's a functional module or interface, you, like something that makes sense in, in your code base, but it should test a single thing because if they fail, we want to like be able to pinpoint the problem. Uh, we should attempt to isolate the thing, although like there is a whole debate here on uh, how much should we isolate? Should we like mock everything? Should we allow the rest of the system, like of our code to be like semi okay to mock or or to leave as is or whatever. I'm not gonna get into this. I'm there's a whole bunch of other folks uh, talking about this. I'm just going to say that uh, what what isolate means depends on your preferences in your code base in your actual program. Um, 
it should be easy to handcraft interesting examples for obvious edge cases. And again, as I said, you might miss some of them because, well, that's what happens. Um, and like one of the things to be careful about is even if all your unit tests pass, that doesn't mean that you don't have bugs, definitely. <laughs> um, because yeah, you can miss non-obvious edge cases or, um, or other interesting cases. Uh, now, for whoever's not familiar with how HUnit works, I, I, I thought I, like I actually didn't know some of the things that I because I never looked at the source code uh, for for HUnit, so I thought it it was kind of interesting. So I, I felt like uh, sharing it. So like HUnit, the like the D unit test library in Haskell has this core data library which is called Test, and Test has a constructor called Test Case, which gives which allows you to add an assertion. And assertion is uh, just IO unit, <laughs> right? So it's uh, it has it's, it's uh, literally a type alias to to IO unit. Um, then we can like create like this testless constructor tells us that we can have a tree of tests, right? We can literally have um, a as arbitrarily deep tree of tests, and this is just for the sake of kind of grouping tests together and. Like providing some sort of hierarchy to to display tests in in a reasonable way, and then the last thing that we need to be able to do like to properly display test is to have to give them tags or labels or names, right? And, and that's all. Like this is the whole type. <laughs> you, 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 like you can think of it as uh, this is the like test label is a way to name things. Test list is just the hierarchy, like, and then assertion is the actual test cases. Okay. Um, so then like a tree looks kind of like this, right? You can have a label at the top where you can say root or top level or whatever. Then of course you're, you're, you're not, you're not going to write them like this. I'm just going trying to kind of give you an idea of how this data type looks like. If you, if you have an easier time looking at an example than that data type. Um, and then you can have labels with, uh, uh, like, uh, cases here, and then you can have uh, sub lists of sub lists and so on. Right. Um, or like in a different uh, kind of format, you can have like you can see it as a tree, a tree like this, right? Where you have the top level test and then some checks and others. Um, okay. And then how does like how do we how does HUnit uh, uh, show errors? Well, it shows them by this HUnit failure uh, type, which uh, has a location and a reason. Uh, it's an exception, so that's why it uses IO as assertions. You, you can try exceptions like uh, IO exceptions, and that's how a, a unit fails, a, a unit test fails. And the reason that we see in H and failure is can be either hey fail and, and that's it, like just a reason, or expected and that's what the first non maybe string is, but got and that's the second string is, and the maybe is just a like an optional uh, like extra message to to show. Uh, and the failure is just uh, like given a error message with like this string, uh, we generate an IOA right for for errors where we make sure like deep seek is just a way to make sure that message doesn't throw like it's not an exception while uh, like uh, instantiating message, <clears throat> and then you use an IO exception throw with like a unit failure for the location and the reason. Um, Okay, and then like we have the assert equal, which uh, unless actually is the same as expected, we will do a. Uh, so unless they're the same, we're going to deep seek everything just to make sure that we don't have any exceptions in the messages or the values, and then we throw I/O with like the other constructor, right? And everything is pretty much just uh, showing the values and uh, the preface messages, kind of. Uh, if it's an empty string, transform it to nothing. Otherwise, just show it. Um, it, it like if it, this is just for who's, who's curious, it doesn't really. It's not that important. I, I just thought uh, it's it's interesting uh, the way that they're represented as i exceptions. And then oftentimes we will see the um, um, actor range assert pattern in, in unit test, which kind of looks like this, right? So we have like this is the uh, like the tree, right? This is the top level. This is the Next level, and this is the actual test, and these are all get uh, our labels actually in our test tree, uh, and then we usually have this sort of a range, right, where maybe we need to flush the database and then do, like create a user using this sort of uh, uh, API, and then we can 
actually run the thing we're testing, for example, get the count of users. And then we can assert that the result is one, right? That we have only one user after we've cleaned up the database and added one user, which is a reasonable way to test things probably uh, for this uh, imaginary API. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I actually, that's a good time to, uh, to uh, get that question. Um, Okay, so the question is, I'm not gonna read this one. So why do we use DeepCQ to fully evaluate all arguments before throwing an error? Uh, the reason is we don't, like we want to know exactly when the error happens, right? So if we have an exception while evaluating the arguments, then we want to throw that exception. Uh, and if not, then if everything like evaluates properly, then we want to throw the exception in the, in the unit test. We want to like throw other exceptions first because those are more important. Um, okay. Uh, so why, again, why unit tests? And I, I, I said it's, they're easy to write, they can complain property tests very well, right? Because you don't have to worry too much about generators and why generators are uh, um, um, and whether they, they generate the interesting cases. We can just forget about that, write the interesting cases manually through unit tests and then let the generator generate like the complex cases and uh, cases that you might not think about. Uh, and I think you can make do a better job at making them reasonable and maintainable, right? So what do we want to get out of unit tests? Where we want to gain confidence in the implementation. Uh, we want to allow reviewers to double check their understanding uh, while reading our code, right? Through like unit tests. Uh, and we want to like to give more context for people reading the code later, right? Which is kind of like the, the context for when we're adding a change and context for later, right? Um, and again, Kind of in the same category, you want to not uh, break something we introduced now uh, later. Uh, okay, so going back to the example from earlier, uh, this is the same example from before, right? So given this example, uh, let's say we like let's say we fold this example right in this like uh, comment here, and then we add a new test which uh, creates by email, right? Creates any user by email, and then we assume that that's that works as well as uh, creating a user by name, right? Um, and then we want a new test, and again this one is folded here, right? Uh, that, that we when we don't add any user, the result is zero, and then we maybe add a new test where. Um, where we are two users, right? And we expect the result to be two. And as you can see, uh, this becomes like, imagine everything was unfolded. This would be probably around 50 lines of code and pretty hard to kind of scan visually, right? Because it's kind of has like a lot of things in between, like there's a lot of noise in between the tests, right? Um, so our values say we have to gain confidence or we'd like to gain confidence in our reviewers to double check and so on, but it's kind of hard to do that when things are hard to read, right? And unfortunately, a lot of the tests that I've seen in code bases I, I, I've seen are like that, where they, like things are just written down uh, and people give less importance to, to test and how they format tests. Um, so like there's, we, we can easily notice that there's a lot of repetition. So we can start by trying to remove some of that repetition, right? So one of the repetitions, hey, well, we have the same sort of similar range block, similar act block, and like kind of the similar uh, uh, flow to all tests. So let's factor that out, right? So we can have this run test uh, helper, which has takes a description and a range act and expectation, and then kind of fills everything up, right? Rather than us having to do it manually. Uh, and then a run test would look like this, right? Where we say run test, description, uh, then the next line is what to do uh, in the arrange part, then is what to do uh, like the actual test and then the expected result, right? Then we can rewrite this uh, whole thing. Of course it's traverse because traverse is always the answer. Um, like this, right? Where we can already see, we can have two examples in this slide rather than a single example. and it's. It's easier to read, right? Because like all the examples are like on top of each other. So it's it's a lot easier to kind of get an idea of, hey, what are the things we're testing? What is expected? What, like it's a lot easier. It's just information here and not no syntax, no Haskell to kind of get, or like language to get in your way. Um, and I like this a lot. And basically this is the main idea. And the rest of, uh, the, rest of the examples are just slight improvements on this idea, right? So you can easily see that instead of having uh, uh, this sort of uh, uh, tuples, we can um, we can have, for example, uh, a data type like a record, where we can 
just name all of the inputs, right? And then our tests can look like this, which is, again, slightly better because rather than trying to remember what each element in the tuple is, they have a name and we can write it as that. Um, then, <clears throat> again, let's have a quick look. This is the before, right? And this is the after. Uh, so I hopefully you agree that this is easier to read by everyone. This can be read even by the non-Hustler and kind of get an idea and even might be able to change it. Whereas this might be a lot scarier to, to, to read and change. Um, okay, and then I think you can do even better in this case, uh, especially, right? Because uh, like I, I was going to say that we can even make two, like fit in two examples in a single slide, which is kind of awesome. Uh, but we can do even better, right? Like this whole thing is, we can see that we we always do posts here to create users and we always do gets here to, to get the, the thing. So like in this particular case, we can even improve just this modules testing, right? By kind of, let's say, modeling it out with, with some better types, right? So for example, the arrange, we notice that it's always like either create or by user create by email. Uh, then we can simplify our count test rather than having IOs for a range and act, we can just have a list of range APIs, right? Where we, we, we just create this simple thing. Um, and then the uh, the run test becomes kind of similar, but instead of doing the range that we get as a parameter, we just traverse some run range, right? Which just uh, kind of goes over this and does the appropriate post, right? Um, and then instead of getting the like running passing the get, we can just say, well, we're always going to the result is always get count, right? And then we can assert the result with uh, what we got. Um, so again, this makes it even easier to read. And now the complete example, you can fit three, <laughs> uh, uh, three on a on a single slide. And uh, arguably, this is even easier for a domain expert to read, right? So uh, and even maybe modify, right? Because you can have a description or the like what to do before and what the expected result is. And that's like literally the minimum, like the exact amount of information you'd expect to see from this sort of test, right? It's name, what to do before, and uh, like what's the expected result. But it's all in a way that it's more, I should say, optimized for reading and for, for kind of understanding the test rather than writing it out, right? Um, so yeah, that's the main uh, thing I wanted to share. Uh, and yeah, so let's quickly go to the takeaway. So if, if there's something you take away from this talk, it's not, not even the unit test part, I'd say just don't, I, I, I don't think it's, healthy to kind of say unit tests are better, property tests are the way, or we should always use integration tests. I think they all complement each other in very interesting ways, and uh, we should all just figure out a way to, to use them depending on the code base together to, to the to best effect. And also, like, look into the other kinds of testing, especially formal verification. Some of them might surprise you, and uh, might uh, you, you might uh, uh, have some, some fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah, of course, make sure CI runs the test, because that's always uh, all the tests and the same tests that you can run locally and so on. Um, make it easy to run tests locally is also very important because if you're not, then folks are not going to run them. Um, make it easy to debug tests, especially if you have a lot of integration tests, people are going to be debugging a lot. So um, that's also very, very useful to do. Uh, again, test messages, like the error messages of tests, that, that's also very, very important for for future us, <laughs> right? Because uh, when you write them, it might not be, it might be obvious, but later, like a few months later, it might not be as obvious. So great um, error messages are, are very important. Um, and yeah, try out the, the, the thing that I just wrote down now, right? Try out to, to think about how do I make this, like what kind of data makes sense for this test and how do I make it such that that's the only thing, that's the first thing I see, right? And everything else can be like an afterthought in somewhere, like some helpers some, and so on. Um, okay, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I will be, I'll be taking questions. I'll be in the Hangout afterwards, but uh, yeah. Uh, let me like go quickly finish the, the, the slide and say that we are hiring. So if you're into Haskell, we are hiring Haskell engineers and engineering managers. You can find more info at the uh, uh, link on the screen. And yeah, you can, you, Hasra has a booth, so you can um, come to our booth and uh, have a chat and ask questions about what we do. Uh, so yeah, you can, and you can find me on social media. Uh, I'm especially active on Twitter, the others not so much. 
thank you very much Evie for sharing um, your experiences there your insights and hopefully that's been helpful for some people as they think about their processes um, and how they manage things as well.